All right, boys and girls, your boy BQ back up in the place to be with episode number two of the returning Power Moves podcast. This was a podcast that I had back in the day in the very early stages of NWA Power. Uh, when I reviewed episode one, it was actually my highest uh, viewed, listened to podcast ever. Uh, but the thing was, interest died pretty quickly uh, within about three episodes after that. I think mainly because my audience wasn't really interested in it at the time, which was weird because there was so much former TNA talent. But I just think there's a lot of TNA fans that only watch TNA and everything else is kind of the enemy a lot of the times. Uh, and I think, but I think over the past, I mean, excuse me, over the, yeah, over the past, I don't know, a couple of years, like probably since the pandemic, honestly, I, th I think, I think that's improved a little bit. I've experimented with some NWA content over the past several months. It's done well. And I know that it's going to take a little bit to build this particular show up. Uh, but if I can get 250 listens, um, you know, to start off in the early stages here, I can, I can work with that. I can build off that. And, uh, you know, it'll justify me doing this show. I can, uh, can definitely work with that. I'm trying to do my part as small as it is to get some people to give the company a chance. I think I have a lot of listeners who kind of trust my opinions. And I have listeners that also don't trust my opinion, but I think I have a lot of listeners that trust trust what I say is good and what is bad. And uh, I think I have some people as well that listen to me no matter what, no matter what I cover. You know, like I listen to Vince Russo no matter what he talks about. I, I listened to him review Raw and SmackDown, and I haven't seen those shows in eight, nine years. So, you know, I'm hoping those people who kind of tune into me are like, you know what, let me give this company a chance. I think it's it's um it's been held against them unfairly over the years what their initial roster was. Because you look at the Eddie Kingstons and Eli Drake and Ricky Starks, guys that are very big elsewhere. Even the Nick Aldis and James Storm and, um, you know, they had some big names. They had some big time names. I think people unfairly hold those days against them because we're just in a different time now. AEW didn't exist. If it didn't exist today, it would still have big names. And TNA would have big names. But that's just not uh, the nature of how the wrestling landscape is right now. So I think right now NWA is doing an excellent job of building the stars of tomorrow. I, I would love to see TNA do a little bit better job of that. What I mean by saying that is most champions at NWA hold the titles for a fairly long period of time. So there's no hot shotting or anything like that. But you, if you look at the roster, the, the men and the women, you can see names on there where, where you can envision them being the world champion one day. They haven't been a champion yet, but you can see a path to them getting there. Like Odinson, for instance, I think he was the national champion at one point, but he's for the most part been a tag team champion. You can see a path to him being in a year or two being the guy for the company. And then, you know, if you look at the women, whether well, it's Taylor Rising, Natalia Markova, Ruthie J, I, I think you can see people there as well that you can see being the woman one day, being the girl one day, if it came down to it. Like if Kenzie Page and um, EC3 left the company tomorrow, you're like, okay, I can see some people who can step in. You know, it's not that like, like when Nick Aldis left, it was like, fuck. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they, I don't think they have that issue right now. And you can say the same for TNA. Like if Jordan Grace and Moose left, if Jordan Grace left, you might as well kill the division at this point. But if Moose left, you're like, oh, sh you know, that's not good. But yeah, they got the Hammerstone and Alexander, so it's, it's not that big of a deal. But I think NWA is doing a very good job of just setting up um, the stars they eventually want to be in that role. Like they were prepared for Camille to leave. Kenzie Page filled into that role. She's filled in quite nicely. You know, so let's get into this episode, though. This was Hard Times. It was reported to have 1,200 people in attendance. I think it looks like at least 15. I never trust 
the reports because uh, when I like when I went to AW Collision recently, horrible show by the way. But when I went, it was reported two thousand people in the crowd, but there were more. I I mean, I just came from TNA Hard to Kill, which was about sub two thousand, but it was you know the audiences were not the same. <laughs> so th- that's why you know I don't always trust these numbers. But it is a it is a good crowd. It looks great on TV. It looks like it could be an episode of Collision, to be honest. Um, just just looks very very nice. If you compare it to uh, Saw Win several months ago, which I didn't think looked good, uh, this looks very professional. Ever since they've been on the CW, it's looked it's looked very professional. Every set of tapings, every location looks different on screen. It kicks off with an opening package highlighting Aaron Stevens and. Um, his team BFT taking on the Immortals in the main event. And I stated last week when I was recording um, my my review that they used to do the Joe Galley video packages to, to kick off the show. And I thought they were good, but this is what they're doing right now is a little more refreshing. I prefer this to, to his voice because we hear his voice the whole episode. I say that, you know, I, I think the same thing with like Tom Hannafin when they open up Impact. Like, I'm just like, I don't want to hear his voice right away. I'm going to hear it the whole show, you know. So what they're doing right now, I think, is it's just more refreshing. I enjoy it more. They played, um, if anything's going to make someone turn off this program, though, they were showing this pro- this promo with Kratos with the Immortals. And Kratos did this rap that was one of the most cringe. I like Kratos, too, by the way. One of the most cringe things I've ever seen in, in wrestling. It was it was really, really bad. Um, if you're someone who's like casually turning it tuning in, I would turn it off uh upon seeing that. I, I thought it was awful. I definitely wouldn't replay it to kick off the show. I didn't like it when it happened, and I didn't like it to kick off the show. But the main event of this program is the Immortals having to give up their U.S. tag team titles to get a title shot versus the seemingly unbeatable Blunt Force Trauma managed by Aaron Stevens. As I said, this is hard times. Um, They're breaking up their pay-per-views into episodic television right now. So that's a lot of the reason for the larger crowd. It kicks off with... um, I wasn't a big fan of this opening match. And I'm always going to be honest. I think half of NWA's roster is very well, uh, very well positions them for the future. And I think half of it is is really bingo hall. You know, I, I, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Usually the pay-per-views don't feature those talents. They feature the ones you're really building the company off, but, my opinion as a wrestling fan, little bingo hallish uh, at the bottom of the card. This one is in that ballpark. Not quite, but it's in the ballpark. It's the Fixers versus Tim Storm and a mystery partner. Not a Fixers fan. And, and I always have to point out when I say that, I'm not necessarily bearing someone or saying they suck. Like it is impossible to be a fan of every single wrestler you see on TV. So with this group, they're they are not my favorite. Uh, the reason I say it is because I don't know if it was like pandemic era. What I don't know exactly when when it was, but they would have special episodes with wrestlers hosting them, and there was an episode that the the fixers hosted, and they I just found them so annoying. I thought it was just so goofy. I thought it really took away from the episode. I just didn't I just didn't enjoy it. And Jay Bradley, like he was kind of a badass in TNA. He didn't do a lot there, but I thought he was presented pretty well. Like I would have I forgot what his name was there, but I would have preferred if the fixers were a version of that. Of that like real bullyish type of gimmick. Um, but the the way they are currently constructed and presented is, is kind of what I'm I'm saying. Just very indie, very bingo hall. So they don't really do it for me. I think they were the inaugural U.S. Tag Team Champions, but um, I don't know, man. They're they're not for me. They're not for me. They take on Tim Storm, which I can't believe they keep finding him work, which good for him, you know. I thought he was 
truly retiring. I didn't think they could find anything intriguing for him to do. So I thought it made sense when they retired him and put him in the booth. Um, but thank God they retired him out of the booth because, as I've said many times, I thought that broadcasting team was really hurting the company for a long time, mainly Velvet Sky, but just Tim Storm with just any kind of lack of, just complete lack of emotion next to Joe Galli with all this emotion. It was just, the contrast was awful. And um, I prefer him in the ring. And I don't mind him. I don't I don't mind his matches. I like Tim Storm. But he has a mystery partner. You might as well have brought me out. It is a guy from one of their territories, uh, trained MMA fighter, JAC. Does not look like an intimidating fellow, uh, but he he has some talent. However, I think it's a bit of a, a fart in church when you're saying, hey, you don't know who his partner is going to be, and then it's just someone you're getting introduced and never heard of before. You know, I, I just don't think kicking off the episode between Kratos' rap and this mystery partner, I don't think they were off to the best start. But the match was okay for what it was. Um, the Fixers win in the end with the Ligurski slam, which is kind of a bullshit finisher. I I find a lot of wrestlers finishers to be bullshit, so this is not a shot at him. But I say that when someone has a finisher less devastating than the moves they're doing, doing in the match. So I usually call it a, a bullshit finisher. And it's the same finisher that freaking and ended the last episode with the Killer Bees. But yeah, uh, Fixers win here. I don't know where they're, what the, what this is supposed to set up or where it's or where it's going. I think the show could have done without this, but it, it's it's whatever. Kyle Davis backstage with Natalia Markova. Um, I'm liking Kyle Davis in this role a little bit better. I've I don't love his ring announcing, but I don't really love anyone's ring announcing. I, I I have a very high standard when it comes to it, but the like the scratchy voice ring announcing is just not for me. And I didn't even really like his his uh on stage interviews, uh, like on set when he was doing the live interviews. I didn't even really like those to be honest. But there's something about this backstage here where we usually see uh, May Valentine, but there's something about this where he's He's a little more settled into it. Uh, he's not overselling anything. He's just talking to him. There's no live. I, I just think without the live audience there, he comes off better on screen. That's just that's just my opinion. Uh, I would imagine he wears several hats for this company, so he's uh, viewed as an asset. And I doubt they're going to make any on-screen changes anytime soon. Like I, I think Sam Laterna, I would have retained her in some way. I just think she's a great backstage interview, a great ring announcing, like round ring announcer. Like I think she's perfect for them personally. Uh, but yeah, I, I truly think this backstage role, the May Valentine role for him is, is I'm not saying that's the only way you should pre present him on TV. I don't expect him to be replaced as the ring announcer anytime soon, but I'm just saying I enjoyed this more than, uh, than usual. He did an interview with Markova. I'll get into this a little bit more later when we, I get to Kenzie Page's promo. And then the standout, Taylor Rising, takes on Miss Star. Miss Star hasn't been one of my favorites so far, but you know, I'm open to being proved, proved wrong. Taylor Rising is someone that I, I think is really, really talented. She's one of those people that when I say you can envision them being world champion in a couple of years, like she falls into that category. She's she's one of those that that, you know, no pun intended, that stands out. So I thought the match was pretty good. There was a, a bit of a botched hurricanrana on the outside that they kind of played off pretty well, kind of turned it into a senton. Uh, it was clearly a misfire, but they played it off pretty well. And then the the announcers didn't overplay. A, like, like if you're watching just AEW and someone messes something, Taz is talking about it for half an hour or, or Tony Schiavone trying to justify, oh, well, maybe this and this. And and Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler was awful about that back in the days, just continuing to talk about a botch. Like they're trying to cover it up, but by continuing to talk about it, you're just bringing more attention to it. The announcers did a very good job with that. And I could be wrong. Maybe it wasn't, but it, it looked like she was going for her, her Karana um, Taylor rising on the outside and it just kind of turned into a seated senton. 
Uh, and it finished with a roll up. Not my favorite finisher in the world. I didn't really like any of the finishes in these matches. That was that was probably the biggest down of this episode was just the finishes. Um, but she wins with a roll up. So they're playing into this neck injury angle with Miss Star that I miss. I, I missed what happened there. I, I'm. I would say I watched the majority of the episodes the last couple seasons. There were some I missed here or there if I was just busy or whatever. But I, I, I don't know what happened here. I don't know what they're, but they're playing into that being the reason she lost. That's why the the roll up worked in the end. Um, but I would like to know what is going on there. They they like their neck braces in NWA or, or their injured neck gimmicks. So then after this, Kate, uh, Kenzie Page cuts this backstage promo. Phenomenal. Fucking fire. When she beat Camille once upon a time, I did question it only because at the time as a fan, I would have rather seen Natalia Markova or Angelina Love beat Camille. Um, I would have loved for Taryn Terrell to beat her. But so so when Kenzie Page won, I was kind of like, hmm, interesting. But there, as I said last week, Pretty Empowered is one of the brighter spots on the show. They have worked on themselves physically, that they, they look great. I said that they cut these promos that could be seen as cringe in any other company. Like, they, they make the promo work for them. They, they believe in it. It is them. And it works. But if you, if you go for that same mean, mean girl uh, style of gimmick, the beautiful people did it the best. But if you go for that mean girl style promo anywhere else, it probably comes off forced and unnatural. But this promo by Kenzie Page talking about Markova never being able to win the big one, which normally when they say that, the wrestler does win the big one. I I don't know what they're going to do here. I'm actually really looking forward to this match because I like both girls and I really don't know who's going to win. But the passion here, it didn't come off scripted. Like you turn on AEW and you hear these Mercedes Monet multi million dollar contract. This this woman cutting these scripted, lifeless, dry, boring promos, and you're paying her all this money, and you got this young lady in the company just killing it on the mic, killing it. I thought this was tremendous. Just, I it it just I mean it, it's apples and oranges to compare the companies, but I mean like as I said, you turn on this big company, horrible, horrible mic work. You turn this on Kenzie Page, just destroying this. I don't know who's going to win this match because Kenzie Page is just doing her, the work she's doing is too good. I would not have took taken the titles off Pretty Empowered. So that's another thing, too, where I'm like, I don't know if I see them taking the belts off all three girls because it's hard to envision where they go next. But I, I, you know, I've been trusting Billy Corgan's creative mind lately, so we'll see. Markova has had several chances at this title. I thought they, I, I really thought she should have beat Camille. And 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 now I'm kind of like, man, are, is Markova going to lose again? I think she could be good as the NWA champion. I'm I'm really like I I really honest to God, maybe you you know maybe you guys know because the match already happened. I think it already happened. I think it's still hard times next week. I don't know. I honest to God have no fucking clue who who wins this. But I'm really looking forward to the other two matches on the card next week. Not so much, but. The, the main event is making me tune in for sure. So I am i can't wait for that. But yeah, props all day to Kenzie Page. This was just absolute fire. And then the main event of this program was the U.S. Tag Team. Champ- excuse me, before that, I'm sorry. Next week, they're doing the tag team, the U.S. Tag Team Tournament. And uh, Kyle Davis interviewed Vampiro backstage because he's you know managing Mecha Wolf and Alex Misery. And Vampiro had no, he's been cutting promos lately backstage. Very, very cryptic almost, but they've been doing little video packages with him. And uh, Vampiro had no clue what he was talking about. So I'm just wondering if he's playing into the dementia as a gimmick or or what. Um, 
Is it dementia? Is that what he's got? Or it's um maybe not dementia. It was uh Alzheimer's. I, man, it's been so long since I've heard him talk about it. I, I watch his videos on Facebook um talking about it and I, I don't remember. But they look like they're maybe playing into that a little bit. So uh we'll see. I guess you gotta give up the US tag team titles to get a title, a world tag team title shot. I was kind of unaware of that, but it seems like that that's the case. Um, cause you know, what's his fuck? Uh, God, I don't remember his name cause I'm not the biggest fan in the world, but that, that relinquished the uh, national champion so he can wrestle EC3 for the, for the title. I guess you got to do that in this company. I know with the TV championships, obviously you need to, but I don't know. I just wouldn't have champions versus champions because it kind of, takes away from the gimmick they're going with the TV champion where they have to win all these matches, but then these other champions just can just say, Hey, I want to wrestle and give up the title. I, I don't know. But yeah, the main event was the U S tag team champions, the immortals, immortals, excuse me, Odinson and Kratos. Who was Odinson's first tag team partner in the company? Is that, is that guy gone? I remember he had a different partner. It was like a bigger dude. I mean, bigger as in like heavy and they take on blunt force, trauma, damage and carnage. Managed by Aaron Stevens. And they're not giving up their belts to the last minute till they know that Aaron Stevens is not up to something. And they did a good job of telling a little story here to make you think Aaron Stevens was up to something. Uh, you know, talking about his glove. And then Kratos cut a promo saying that his gear bag was stolen. So he was just kind of wrestling in, in gym wear. And um, I really didn't know who was going to win here. I thought there was an opportunity for the Immortals to win. I think the blunt force trauma, uh, first of all, I'm glad they found something for Marche Rocket to do because I think they've, between TNA and NWA, kind of struggled to find his role. So I'm glad they found something for him to do with this tag team because I like him. But I think it's going on a little too long. I liked uh, at Saw Win when, when Aaron Stevens was dressed up like I don't remember exactly what characters were back there, but he kind of came out, delivered a loaded, loaded glove shot for the Knights of the Round Table match. I thought that was pretty good. Um, I would have, as I said, I would have taken, I, I said this in a different upload, I would have taken the titles off Blunt Force, Force Trauma when they started on CW. And maybe they didn't want to do the title changes because you're starting on a new app, potentially new audience, new people tuning in. And this is one of the acts that they think is, or that they feel is, is most over, which is understandable. I think the match was Tim Storm and Jack Stane that they took on. And I would have put the belts on them in all honesty. I think that would have just been a good way to start the season with a title change. But I think we're going a little, a little long with these guys now as entertaining as Aaron Stevens is. And um, as good as a team as job as this team has done, I don't know. I, I think we're I think we're getting close to uh close to the end. I think we need to be. But Blunt Force Trauma ultimately did win this match. Aaron Stevens distracted Odinson. Odinson knocked him on his ass, turned around, caught a drop kick by Carnage, a drop kick. And uh that was that was the match. That was the win. As I said, I didn't love the finishes, but to not contradict myself. I don't mind, you know, part of me also doesn't mind a drop kick finish because you watch AEW and you hit these people with everything. They kick out of everything. And it's like, okay, I'm watching this 20 minute match of nonstop kickouts just for someone to hit their finisher in the end. We know the match is not going to end without the damn finisher. So here, I just think it makes sense every once in a while. I'll be like, yo, you, he, he just caught this dude off guard. With the drop kick. That's it's okay to end a match like that. As much as like part of me is like, I don't really like the finishes. It's maybe because I didn't really want BFT to win this match. <laughs> um yeah, but as much as I kind of didn't like him at the same time, it is refreshing. It is refreshing to say to, to watch a match and just know that it can end at any moment rather than hey, we're just watching this until someone hits their finisher, if you understand what I'm talking about. So um, I don't remember the card for next week. Exactly. As I said, the first couple matches don't do a lot for me, 
but the this Kenzie Page uh, Natalia Markova main event is is one to tune in for. I genuinely have no idea who's going to win because I don't think you should take the title off Kenzie Page, and I also don't think Markova needs another loss. So I don't know what they're going to do here exactly, but I'm very very much looking forward to it, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Power Moves, and we'll be um, we'll be doing this again next week. You know, as I said, if I if I knock out 250 on the views, I can live with that. It's something I can I can build on over time. Um, but I know that uh, it's going to take a little bit to get there, which is all good, all good. And I know I did get a few new subscribers uh, looking for NWA content. So happy to have you aboard. I am your boy BQ. I've got TNA Rebellion here in a few hours that I got to get to. So I'm going to sign off. Talk to you soon. Peace. <laughs>